You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. I have a lot of really cool friends who do a lot of really cool things. I wanted to make it a goal to sit down with these friends and spend about 15 minutes or so getting to know them better and find out about their past, present, and their future. The result is this show. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is 15 Minutes With. Doug Welch is a podcaster, an author, and a new media and social media consultant. Doug, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, as always, Grant. Well, it's my pleasure to have you on the show. And um, you do a lot of uh, really creative stuff. And you're somebody who, um, uh, as somebody who watches you on the internet, you put out a lot of content. You put out a lot of things. And we're going to talk about that. But I'd like to talk about where did you grow up? I grew up in a very small farm town in Ohio called New London, uh, about 2,000 people. Uh, grew up on the edge of the village, within the corporation limits, as we say, but I, but budding up to the land that my father would farm. And then I traveled all over the farms of the of the county and township with my father when I was growing up. So I sort of had a a choreless farm upbringing. I didn't have to get up in the morning at four with like all my other friends who went to school with and do chores in the morning. But I, I grew up in a very small rural town. Uh, I said I had a 1950s upbringing in the 70s. Yeah. And um, were you, what was sort of the first creative thing that, that captured your attention living on that farm? Because, uh, you, you know, what I think is, is you're somebody who, you, you know, I follow you on Instagram and I follow you other places and you post a lot of pictures and you're very visual. Were you enjoying sort of the, the natural wonders growing up uh, out there in Ohio? I think I was always taken with nature. We, we, we had the ability to literally walk out the back door. You know, our mother would say, go play, you know, and uh-huh. come back when it's dark. You know, uh, that, uh, that was kind of my upbringing. And so we had all these farms and woodlots and fence rows and everything else that we as kids would always just go exploring in. And so there were always things catching my eye. I will say that I don't think I actually dove into photography, and this sounds very silly. I, don't, I didn't dive into photography until the digital era. Uh huh. Because um, I didn't grow up exactly rich as a child, and so paying for lots of film and lots of development wasn't in our cards in our family. So I took some pictures when I was growing up, but it was really when the digital world happened that I was able to dive in and exploit that you know yeah. cheap way of doing photography <laughs> to the utmost degree. And I do that everywhere I go. I take a camera nearly everywhere I go um, beyond my iPhone, which is always with me. But I do tend to carry a camera bag because it's very much with me I get struck with something. Mm -hmm. And this is true about everything that I do. I'll be walking along, I'll be talking with someone, and something will just strike me. And I drive my wife mad, I'm sure, because I'll be walking down the street and I will just suddenly come to a dead, complete (laughs) stop and start looking at the leaves on a tree or something. Um, But that's it certainly is integrated into my life, and that's the way... I've always approached it. It's just whatever catches my eye. Yeah. And and so as a kid, I didn't get to establish my, but but just enjoying that was certainly part of it. You're an author. You've, you've, you write a lot. Um, you know, we talked about your blog posts and stuff like that uh, before we started recording this. But were you writing as a kid? Were you enjoying writing as a kid? <laughs> I did not write much as a kid <laughs> at all. I didn't, I didn't have much upbringing in writing. You know, I went to a standard public high school. Uh, my class had 100 kids in the class. Not, you know, not not in my individual classroom, but in my entire senior class was 100, 100 kids. Um, no, it really wasn't pushed that much. And I, my wife always jokes to me, she, she went to Catholic grade school, and of course they drilled them in the five-paragraph structure and all this stuff. And when I got to college and met her in college, she said, like, you've never written an essay? It's like, <laughs> no. Uh, so again, la- uh, writing as a profession, as a as an outlet for my creativity came later. And yeah, even in that regard, I don't tend to write fiction. Mm-hmm. I've written right. poetry in the past because um, I'm also a music person in that regard. But um, I write nonfiction, and my wife writes fiction, but I, I really never found a, a place to write much fiction. So I tend to write all sorts of nonfiction stuff, and, and you don't may not think it's that creative sometimes, but I find it to be very creative, and I also find it to be very useful and trying to not necessarily educate other people, but to make them think. Everything I wrote was always about trying to help people think about their own lives and stuff. Yeah. Well, um, uh, another thing I wanted to ask, <laughs> if this uh, interests you as a kid, is you're somebody who um, I know that a couple times over the past 
10 or so years that I've known you, um, will learn about a new piece of technology or a new piece of uh, software or whatever from, from something you have posted. Were you always fascinated with technology as a kid? I will say, yes, I was. My father is and, and was a mechanic. He worked for a small construction company. He kind of hobby farmed himself, but he worked as a mechanic for all the farmers in the area. And so in traveling around with him, I got to see all sorts of technology. I mean, as a kid, I got to drive a huge combine harvester, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, around the fields. And I have several summers I spent going around in circles on an old John Deere tractor fitting our farm and stuff like that. But certainly technology always intrigued me. Mm-hmm. And that is something that actually led to a career later for me. Because in watching my father, one of the things I always really credit him with is he taught me how to troubleshoot. He taught me, you know, I learned the scientific method in school, which really, that's part of my everyday life for me is that scientific method. But he really taught me how to apply it Mm -hmm. uh, in anything you do. I would see him tear apart motors and that had water running out of them and everything else. And, you know, a day later, have them all pieced back together and running. And I was like, wow. How do you how do you do this? Well, you see this, and you try this, and you try that, and you know you, you do the hypothesis, you do the test, you do the experiments, and eventually you come out with something that's working. And so that really instilled that in me, working with lawnmowers and tractors and and other farm equipment stuff like that. The one thing I realized growing up, I don't like having my hands dirty. <laughs> So being greased up to my elbows or shoulders, digging in an engine or whatever, I realized very quickly, no, that's just not for me. I like doing that type of thinking and work, but yeah. no. So when I went to college, this was pre-internet days. This was pre-home computer days, really. <laughs> in 1982, I went to college, and I had full-time access to computers for the first time ever. My friends had had a couple at Commodores and stuff, but I didn't have full-time access, didn't have my own. And I discovered, oh, well, guess what I can do? I can use technology. I have this aptitude for technology. I think of because of what I learned working with my father that I, for whatever reason, I just knew how to make these things work. And I had the ability to teach others that mm-hmm. same method and to teach them how technology works and how to use it. And so even though I got a degree in theater <laughs> from college, uh, where I spent most of my time, I, I often joke, I spent more time in the theater in college than I probably spent in the classroom because I, I did every job in the theater you could do, in makeup, costume design, lighting design, lighting operation, set design, because I had supposed that when I came out of college that would, might be my career. Um, as it happens, I moved to L.A. seven days after I got married because uh, my wife wanted to be a TV writer. And if you wanted to be a TV writer, you either went here or New York. Thank God we didn't go to New York because I'd probably be crazy by now. Um, so literally, we, we got married, uh, left the day, the wedding party, packed our moving van. We left and arrived in California seven days later. I got here and um, looking for jobs for the first couple months. The first job I got was a technology job. And that's where it went from there. Yeah. No, it's not to say I didn't engage in my creativity in a variety of ways during that time, but that was what was putting money on the table. And I will say, though, the creative part of that troubleshooting served me well throughout that entire part of my career Um, and the ability to be able to talk to other people about it. The the compliment I got again and again and again was, oh, you actually understand and make the, you helped me understand this. I wasn't the exasperated, Give me the mouse type of type of computer <laughs> right. guy, and that actually served me quite well. Yeah, um, but it, it, it was creativity in a different vein, so I had to do other creative things, kind of in the background and around that. And well, and what I was going to say is, uh, technology is sort of one of those things where it's you could change a hard drive in a computer, and you're not going to get your hands dirty as if you were changing the you know uh, I don't even know what you would call a piece of an engine <laughs> you know the timing rods you're I taking guess. the crank crankshaft <laughs> out of a block yeah right uh, yeah I mean you touch anything on an engine you're dirt you're greasy I right just, and so I have often described it I do exactly what my father does except I do it in a nice clean electronic environment <laughs> right. there's be there might be some dusty computers right, you get you some run dust, yeah. on occasion but that little vacuum that takes care of it yeah uh, yeah very clear to me after a while it's like oh that's, yeah I mean I'm using those same skills and everything that same creativity and everything just doing it in a way that I'm not 
I'm not having to use waterless hand cleaner to try and get the <laughs> grease and get it off from underneath your nails. Right. Well, I want to I want to touch back on this um, this background in theater too. What was your Where did you go to college? I went to college at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Not not Bowling Green, Kentucky, but Bowling Green State University in Ohio. It is the sister school on the west side of the state to Kent State on the east. Okay. Uh, it. My sister had gone there for her last two years of her degree. She's like four years older than I am. Um, didn't have a lot of, you know, what are you going to do? I actually started, I was, for one semester, I was in uh, RTVF. I was in radio TV film because they had a radio station. They had a TV station. They had a public uh, TV station for that part of the country. And so I knew I could actually walk into a studio and get hands-on experience there. It's funny how life affects you sometimes, though. The people I met there were just weren't that nice. <laughs> So after about a semester, I switched over to theater because um, I had I had the summer I started in the summer, and I had done a musical theater production at the music college and met all these people. And so, first uh, first night of my fall semester, you know, my second semester in college, I went to the auditions for the the first show of that season, and I'd done theater in high school and really enjoyed it. That was kind of mm-hmm. my creative outlet in in high school was uh, band course and theater theater being the most important to me and uh so i went to the auditions and figured well i'll get a small role whatever but i didn't get cast but i became the stage manager and i met my wife that first day it was her junior year first day (laughs) of my fall semester of my freshman year and it was really one of those weird between the theater and between her that was life that's, yeah, that's you know we've been together for thirty years now. We yeah. married married for thirty years, been together for you know thirty five probably. Yeah, um, and did you? You said you you stage manager, but did and you auditioned, but then you wound up being stage manager. Did you audition more? Like, were you in plays and stuff? Yeah, I was actually in the theater department, so I was required to audition for right. every show. Uh, but I would have done it anyway because I was I really enjoyed that aspect of of the world. I I enjoy theater. I'm not a team sports player. I don't play. St- Sports. I was. My sisters were the sporty ones in high school. Right. Uh, uh, but for me, theater gives you the same sort of teamwork and camaraderie type of feeling, and so that's where I found it. Uh, yeah, I was cast in a variety of a uh, variety of shows over the years, over my four years there, three and a half years there in college, and actually spent one entire summer at the college's um, long running summer theater in Huron, Ohio, called the Huron Playoffs. It's been since the '30s, I think. Um, that's that was a whole semester of my college career was a summer, um, summer doing that where I was you know you you do six shows in eight weeks, yeah, and I was cast in five of the six shows, so you know it's quite a bit of an experience and quite a bit of fun. Had that was rough as a freshman to do something like that, but it, it worked out. Um, but yeah, so I, I I literally did everything in the theater. I was cast in a dance recital at one point. I was uh, because a friend uh, a, f- a fellow theater department person was looking for people who didn't necessarily have to be dancers. She needed some men in the show, so yeah. I ended up in, being in the dance recital. Um, so just a wide variety of stuff. One of my things is I try to be open to opportunity, and I think that's true from my 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 childhood forward. If an opportunity was presented and it interested me, I would you know, I try to try to engage in it whenever I could. Because I saw it as a way of opening doors that you wouldn't otherwise maybe go through. Mm-hmm. Um, nowadays, here in Los Angeles, after all these years in Los Angeles, the way I describe it, if there's money on the table, figure out a way to pick it up. <laughs> and, right. and sometimes it's doing stuff that's outside of your normal area. Right. Um, I, Over the years, I, I've sold paintings. I've sold some photography. I perform music for money. I, all these weird things. I, I would have, often have people meet me in other aspects of my life, from other aspects of my life, and be just gobsmacked. I, yeah. we, we uh, my wife and I used to volunteer in the Andros National Forest as rangers, uh, at the, one of the visitor centers. And one of my fellow uh, Disney employees walked in one weekend and said, "Huh? huh? You weren't here?" And I said, "No, this is my volunteer work." But it was totally the antithesis of what I did on a daily basis with computers, but being up in the forest teaching people about the mountains and the trees and the birds and, and other stuff. Yeah. Uh, people have a hard time, you know, they only think of you about being in one world. But I always tried to be in as many worlds as that's interested me. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to talk about, you and I met through the world of podcasting and uh, over, probably over a decade ago now. Uh, Quiet, anyway. you! You're yeah. getting, making me feel all older. Um, but uh, how did you, where did you first hear about podcasting? I was one of the first podcasters. Yeah. I started two weeks after the term was coined. That's how I describe it. Because 
people have been doing audio on the web for a long time, but in September 2004, the term was coined. The Adam Curry released his little Apple scripts to be able to make an RSS feed that people could subscribe to. And it's like, I had been writing a career column, weekly career column at that point for a good eight, eight years, probably. Um, so I had content. Mm -hmm. And I have friends who do audio. So I called my friend Michael, the founder of my podcasting feed, said, Michael, you got a mic and a, something to connect it to my computer so I can record a podcast? But what's that? And you know, the whole, whole rigmarole there. Uh, so literally two weeks after the term was coined, I recorded my first podcast, which was a reading of my column. And actually continued that uh, audio version for 10 full years, mm -hmm. uh, up till 2014. And that was the Career Opportunities Career podcast? Opportunities, yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was a print publication in San Diego that actually paid me to write it. And uh, it was merely repurposing those columns. And then that led to speaking engagements and, and, and other things, which was, which, which was interesting. In that realm of whole careers, that's one. If you look at my main page on my website, you'll see that there are lots of different links to lots of different things because I have a very diverse set of interests. Yeah. Partially going back to that whole back to that whole opportunities thing of an opportunity presented itself. Someone asked me to write a career column at one point. I've been writing for the trade publications, the technical trade publications back in the pre-internet days like Network World and Internet Info World and Computer World and all that stuff. And someone asked me to write this column specifically. I said, sure, you're going to mm -hmm. pay me for it, even better. Um, so that led down this whole thing of consulting on careers and, and talking to people on careers, and I speak on careers. and, and But it's a, it's a whole different part of my life. Another whole aspect of my life is gardening. I have a yeah. gardening blog and a gardening podcast, and that's a whole nother. And podcasting is a whole other. <laughs> and they, they don't seem to be connected. But over the years, what I found is, I think in reality, everything is connected. I started drawing little, you know, Venn diagrams, little, little circle diagrams of how do these things overlap? And especially between the careers, the new media um, areas, and the writing areas, especially, those three, they just started to, to combine and become into one. A lot of the stuff I would say about careers applied to podcasting. A lot of the stuff I would tell people to do in their careers, like tell people what they do and how well they do it, well, guess what's a way of doing that? Social media, new media, podcasting, YouTube, whatever. That's a great tool to use doing to increase, improve your career. So over the years, things just started to merge and merge and merge. I mean, gardening is still kind of separate. But uh, the other stuff really, and the technology, of course, started to merge all together. Um, so it's only after a period of time that you can start to see how these seemingly desperate things in your life combine together. Yeah. Uh, some people are very lucky that you know they have uh, their yo-yo ma. They started playing cello and they just continue to get better at playing cello and that's their career. It's a straight line, linear progression. Uh, there's people in corporate world who have these little stair steps. You know, you climb the step, plateau, climb the step, plateau, and, th and that's the normal method you always hear people of taking in a corporate world or a typical job. I was really struggling when I was at Disney, well, Disney Imagineering, because I couldn't figure out. I'd been working for about eight years or whatever, and I was really, I was really struggling. What, what is all this coming to? And a friend of mine, uh, her name is Joanne Berhaney, she's a creativity consultant who was working at Imagineering at the time. And one of the nice things of working there is you got access to these people you wouldn't normally have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got talking one day and said, oh, I see, see. You have the straight line, you have the stair steps, there's another type of career that you don't know about. Oh, really? What's that? <laughs> it's called a spiral. <laughs> really? Okay. Like spiral, like circling oh, down the toilet? Yeah, no, 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 no. Hopefully not going down. Yes, yeah, so yeah, spiral <laughs> going upwards. Okay. Um, the trouble with having a spiral type of career or a spiral type of life is you don't, you see no pattern. You have to get into it a certain amount before you start to see the pattern that if you draw a spiral, if you put dots on the page of all the things you do and then you do a spiral between them, you see, oh, there is a connecting influence between all these things. For me, I finally realized that everything I do has something to do with education. Mm -hmm. I don't teach in a classroom necessarily. I'm not a school teacher, but everything I do has something to do with education. In the career world, it's helping people have build the career they deserve. That was the tagline for the show. Um, in technology, it was helping people use technology. Uh, the technology blog uh, subheading is control your technology, don't let it control you. Um, in the gardening, I teach people through my own success and failures, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what to do and not to do in the garden. And that single realization for me became so important to know that 
everything I do has something to do with education. I just enjoy it. It's like theater. It's, it's a, it's a, I come out of a class, I come out of a presentation energized, not drained. Right. And I think that's a, a good way of finding out what really works for you is what energize. What do you come out of energized? What do you come out of drained? And find those things that energize because those are the things you really enjoy and you're, you're probably really good at too. Yeah. Um, I often tell people in the career world, you, if you don't like the work you're doing, you can probably do passable work. You might even do good work. For me, you're not going to do great work unless you have some passion, some excitement, some enjoyment of what you're doing. That's when I think people really shine. And that, that particular rule goes over everything that I do, whether it's gardening or new media or careers or whatever. You, sh- you should have, you should find those little passions. And, I, you know, the whole follow your passion thing has kind of got overworked over the years. But I use it more of a, that's something that obviously interests you and obviously energizes you. Why not pursue that whenever you can? Because um, I meet a lot of people who are stuck in positions that, you know, they're, they're, they're stuck. They're, the, 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 I have a phrase, you know, if you feel like you're trapped, you are. And I meet a lot of trapped people. And I've been trapped myself. That's how I recognize it. I, I often said everything I write, it comes from my own life. Every career column I wrote, every gardening, every technology column comes from my own life. It's mistakes I've made. It's worries I've had. It's thoughts I've had. And so I try to share those with other people in a hope that through seeing my experience, they'll be able to do the hard thinking, as I often call it, in their own life and come up with something better for themselves. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to, to ask you about in terms of, of putting these things out to help people is um, uh, I subscribe to your YouTube channel. And I notice on your YouTube channel, you will put out just short little segments of things. So it's like you you have done a, a I don't know, like an hour long talk about career stuff, but you will just cut out one little point and put that out. And I assume that's on purpose. Like that's, there's a reason behind that. Yeah. A couple of years ago, I, you know, it's one of those things you kind of wake up one morning and go, well, duh. <laughs> you know? And I was doing these long talks and of course it's hard for someone to sit down and watch a 45 minute talk or an hour long talk. It's just, it's a big commitment. And so I got to thinking, well, what can I, oh, well, you know what? And I started looking at some of the talks that given really well, you know, about there's about a minute. Thoughts can break up into about a minute sec- segments throughout the talk. And like, well, why don't I do that? Mm-hmm. And you know, again, it's one of those face palm moments. He's like, well, duh, yeah, of course you should have done that. Uh, so about two years ago, that epiphany came to me, and now, yeah, I use it with everything. If I do a longer talk, or my wife does a longer talk because she also does presentations, um, I will put the whole talk out, and then I'll go back and excise out these like one minute or so segments Mm -hmm. that have a a, a, a thought, a continuous thought in them, and maybe skip stuff that's in the talk, you know, if there's like extraneous stuff between, I'll skip ahead and take another one minute out of there. But those, I think, have become very effective because they give people a taste, it's so the whole drug dealer metaphor. <laughs> you give them. You, I wish there was another metaphor for that. But you give them the taste, and then it's like, oh, and then every video has to watch this entire presentation. Click here, click there, go here, yeah. whatever. And I have seen, you know, some some benefit from that in that people will see that message and then like, oh, okay, click on the little button. Let's go watch the whole thing now. And they may watch it in sections, or whatever, as their time allows. But it's in it's intrigued them enough to go watch the whole thing. Yeah. And so that is, yeah, that's one of those ideas that just came to me one day. It was like, well, of course. Well, and you even, I've noticed you even kind of do it with the gardening stuff too, where you just do, uh, I mean, maybe you shoot those as a gardening minute type thing, but it's just a short little, uh, you know, a little segment in the garden. Yes. The, the, a, a minute in the garden is what they're called. Oh, right, right. I, I'm sorry. I, I, think <laughs> I just went to, I think I produced the 50th in one of those. Those came out of, actually a friend of ours was doing the earth minute. They're uh, ecologists and travel all over the world and do, uh, uh, eclipse watching all over the world and stuff like that. And they started doing these little one-minute segments. And went, again, it was kind of like, ugh, palm to face. Yeah, that's perfect. I, I see these little things. These are the things that I'll stop along the street and, you know, annoy my knife, my wife with by stopping in the middle of the street to do something. But, yeah, there's these little just something I enjoyed for a minute. Some beautiful plant, some beautiful flower, some when we were in Sicily, just showing off the family's garden in Sicily where we were staying. Um, just to give people a little immersive, hey, take a minute out. 
it's a little nice little tidbit and you watch it and it's enjoyable and it's sometimes it's informative i do for the gardening blog i also do more involved things here i am planting these new plants or right. i'm potting up stuff more traditional gardening diy stuff um but those just came to me as something that i would enjoy watching I enjoyed that moment. You know what? How? What does it take to re- pull out your phone and record a minute of video of something that's very pleasant and maybe lay some music in underneath it or whatever? It's um, Again, it's a way of giving people um, something different. It's not something they run into everywhere. Um, the one-minute pieces in general, overall, I think really are effective because they are easily digestible. Mm -hmm. It's not this huge commitment. We do live in a world where it's very hard to find time, but when a minute thing comes up in your playlist on YouTube or in your podcast, it's much more accessible to people than a 45 minute talk. Right. The 45 minute talk could be greatly useful to them, and your hope is, I'm gonna intrigue you, I'm gonna hook you with this, and you'll go watch that longer talk. But if nothing else, I've at least given you that little tidbit that I think's important. Um, I've at least reached you in some way. Yeah. And so I, th- I think that uh, I do longer form stuff, I do shorter form stuff, but th- those things literally just happen as I, I was walking the L.A. River the other day. It was so- something I've been doing lately is I take an hour. I need to get out of the house. I work at home and I need to get out of the house. So I will take a, an hour or so to go to the nursery or to, to the garden store. Or to the I went to the L.A. River the other day. We have a nice section of L.A. River by us which has beautiful plants and stuff. And I just went for a walk and took pictures and... The last one I did was these cottonwood leaves, you know, just blowing in the wind. It's fall. It's, it's just a perfect little moment. And it caught my eye, and I stopped, and I took it. Um, but I think that's important for everything you do. Mm-hmm. When something grabs your attention, there's a reason why. And you need to explore for yourself why that grabbed your attention, what it meant to you, what that person meant to you, what that thing meant to you, what that sight meant to you, what that song meant to you, whatever. Um, creativity is a lot about stopping and recognizing when opportunity is presented to you uh, we can get very busy in our lives and i do this myself i'll be like oh that's so pretty but i gotta get to the store you know whatever and and, and you consciously after a while you consciously know i should have done that why didn't i do that uh, but the whole point is you have to learn how to stop for just a minute or so and say that's important i people joke i carry a paper journal with me i have my iphone i love technology i'm a technophile to the nth degree but I carry a paper journal with me because it's simply faster to grab ideas and thoughts mm-hmm. in the moment and that's what I do it's it I try to make it and this is something I try to teach to other people too you don't want to be sitting down whether you're a writer a podcaster a musician a, a songwriter whatever you don't want to be sitting down sweating bullets looking at the blank page you want to have a series of ideas that when you need to be creative because we all have a need to be creative. We can be inspired, but face it, in most show business <laughs> world, you have to be creative on demand. Having a book full of ideas is a wonderful thing. Yeah. You've already done the hard work of having the idea. When you have a moment where you have to be creative, you were speaking earlier, you want to do a, you know, a weekly show and you want to have a show out every week, it's a lot less stressful to have a whole book of ideas where you can flip through and go, Oh, I'll do that one today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then just sit staring at the, the empty logic screen going, and what, what am I going to record today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's something I learned early on, is, yeah. is you need to really take a moment to capture those ideas as they occur. Because the truth is, if you let an idea go, it's pretty much gone. It, you, it might come around again if the stimulus comes back again in some way, but a lot of times, if you don't write an idea down or don't capture it in some way, it's gone. And you've, I consider that a waste. I consider that wasteful. It's like throwing away food. <laughs> you know, you just don't do that. That's, right. that's, that's gold. Um, Phoebe Efren, the mother of Nora Efren and the other Efren uh, woman writers, said something, told her daughter something uh, when she was dying, actually. She said, dears, everything is copy. And that is really something I apply to life. Everything is copy. The joy, the sadness, the anger, the frustration. Write it down. Take a note of it. You know, make 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 a note of the idea that comes to you in those moments because it's all copy. And I think fiction writers probably understand that more than others. But I think everyone, whether they're doing a podcast or writing songs or whatever, those are the things you always have that you can go back to and say, oh, geez, I need some. 
oh, that was an idea that intrigued me. Let's do that. And then you take the idea further. But if you didn't capture it, it's gone forever. Yeah. And that, I find that sad. Um, that's something I really preach. And you wouldn't think of preaching something like something heavily creative like that to the career world, but I preach it to career world all the time. If you're with a client, if you're, so, if you're solving a particularly difficult problem, make a note of it. Because if you had the problem, there's 10,000 other people out there who had the same exact problem that you can solve for them. Yeah. Uh, and getting it out on the Internet is just the, the, the final step in that process. Yeah. Well, Doug, if people, uh, as we're wrapping up here, if people want to go check out your stuff online, where can they go? Uh, you can go to Douglas E. Welch, W-E-L-C-H, dot com. Uh, trouble having a funky name like that is, you know, you have to spell it to people. <laughs> you learn that when you start to have a podcast. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. Oh, I just realized that I'm going to have to spell my, my URL <laughs> every time I do a show. But yeah, Douglas E. Welch dot com. There you find links to everything that I do. Uh, probably learn more about me than you ever wanted to know. There's links to my um, career column and podcast, my gardening blog, my technology blog, my new media blog, my general blog, my, my word, which is pretty much everything that I do. Photography has become a huge part of it lately. I was over the last couple of years with the with Instagram and other things. Uh, I really am doing a lot more with photography. I'm actually making products with it and other things. Um, but whenever I see something that catches my eye, you'll probably see it there. And uh, my wife laughs at me, but when I realize that I'll be writing something or doing something, or someone asks me a question and I say. What have I written about that in the past? What did I... And I'll actually use Google to search my site because there's <laughs> so much stuff on the site that I yeah. can't possibly be remember. And I will literally do a site search on my own site to try and find stuff that I've written. Because over, you know, since 2004 was the podcast, since 1998 was the column. So there's, I think I figured it's over a million words just in the career <laughs> career columns alone. Yeah. Uh, as long as, as well as everything else that I've done. So it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot out there. I really struggle to keep it up and online sometimes, but it's all there. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram. That's, again, the big thing right now is Instagram that I'm doing a lot with my photos there. But I'm everywhere. I'm on Twitter and, and Facebook and, and other things like that. People can find links to all that. All right. Well, I will put links to all that in the show notes. So if people want to find it, they can. And, Doug, thank you so much for talking to me today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Douglas Welch is an author, podcaster, and new media consultant, and you can learn even more about all his projects over on his website, douglasewelch.com. You can find links to that website and all of Doug's social media accounts in the show notes for this episode over at grantcast.com. 15 Minutes With on the Grantcast is a production of Saturday Morning Media and made possible by the generous Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly donation for as little as a dollar a month. Huge thanks to Shay Stewart, Mer Lafferty, Jeff Peterson, Dale Gadania, Steven Staver, Jackie Klimo, Melissa Crawford, Chuck, Matthew Wayne Selznick, Dave Slusher of the Evil Genius Chronicles, Mike Coughlin, Dorothy Pachoco, John D., Kathy Crawford, Brian Greer, Kerry Whitney, Chuck Tomasi, Chris Foster, Stephen Ng, Clinton of ComedyForecast.com, Vicky DeVries, Mike Wabshaw, Twitter user Buttsingear, a.k.a. Wildcat, Eve Cunning, Mike Hamilton, Gaston Morineau, Reed Loveland, and Ivan Asquith. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly donation today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave this show a review on iTunes. And while you're over on iTunes, be sure to click that subscribe button. That way you'll get episodes the moment they are released. If you have any feedback for the show, you can send it to me directly at grant at throwingtoasters.com or get in touch via Twitter where my username is Toasterboy. Thank you so much for tuning in. Talk to you next time. The Grant Cast is copyright 2016 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco, Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. <laughs>